2. Relation of the divine attributes to the divine. Essence. 1. The attributes have an objective existence. They are not mere names for human conceptions of God, conceptions which have their only ground in the imperfection of the finite mind. They are qualities objectively distinguishable from the divine essence and from each other. The nominalistic notion that God is a being of absolute simplicity, and that in his nature there is no internal distinction of qualities or powers, tends directly to pantheism, denies all reality of the divine perfections, or, if these in any sense still exist, precludes all knowledge of them on the part of finite beings. To say that knowledge and power, eternity and holiness, are identical with the essence of God and with each other, is to deny that we know God at all. The scripture declarations of the possibility of knowing God, together with the manifestation of the distinct attributes of his nature, are conclusive against this false notion of the divine simplicity. Aristotle says well that there is no such thing as a science of the unique, of that which has no analogies or relations. Knowing is distinguishing, what we cannot distinguish from other things we cannot know. Yet a false tendency to regard God as a being of absolute simplicity has come down from medieval scholasticism, has infected much of the post-Reformation theology, and is found even so recently as in Schleiermacher, Roth, Olshausen, and Ritchell. E. G. Robinson defines the attributes as our methods of conceiving of God. But this definition is influenced by the Kantian doctrine of relativity and implies that we cannot know God's essence, that is, the thing in itself, God's real being. Bown, Philosophy of Theism, 141, this notion of the divine simplicity reduces God to a rigid and lifeless stare. The one is manifold without being many. The divine simplicity is the starting point of Philo, God is a being absolutely bare of quality. All quality in finite beings has limitation, and no limitation can be predicated of God who is eternal, unchangeable, simple substance, free, self-sufficient, better than the good and the beautiful. To predicate any quality of God would reduce him to the sphere of finite existence. Of him we can only say that he is, not what he is, see art. By Skura, in Insight, Brit, 18 761. Illustrations of this tendency are found in Scotus Erigena, Deus Nesit Sequid Ist, Kia Non Ist Quid, and in Occam. The divine attributes are distinguished neither substantially nor logically from each other or from the divine essence. The only distinction is that of names, so Gerhard and Quenstedt. Charnock, the Puritan writer, identifies both knowledge and will with the simple essence of God. Schleiermacher makes all the attributes to be modifications of power or causality, in his system God and world equals the natura naturans and natura naturata of Spinoza. There is no distinction of attributes and no succession of acts in God, and therefore no real personality or even spiritual being. See Phlydra, P.R.O.T. Theol, Seek Kant, 110. Schleiermacher said, My God is the universe. God is. Causative force. Eternity, omniscience and holiness are simply aspects of causality. Roth, on the other hand, makes omniscience to be the all-comprehending principle of the divine nature, and Olshausen, on John 1 verse 1, in a similar manner attempts to prove that the word of God must have objective and substantial being, by assuming that knowing equals willing, whence it would seem to follow that, since God wills all that he knows, he must will moral evil. Bushnell and others identify righteousness in God with benevolence, and therefore cannot see that any atonement needs to be made to God. Ritchell also holds that love is the fundamental divine attribute, and that omnipotence and even personality are simply modifications of love, see Mead, Ritchell's place in the history of doctrine, 8. Herbert Spencer only carries the principle further when he concludes God to be simple unknowable force. But to call God everything is the same as to call him nothing. With Dorna, we say that definition is no limitation. As we rise in the scale of creation from the mere jealous act to man, the homogeneous becomes the heterogeneous, there is differentiation of functions, complexity increases. We infer that God, the highest of all, instead of being simple force, is infinitely complex, that he has an infinite variety of attributes and powers. Tennyson, Palace of Art, lines omitted in the later editions, all nature widens upward, ever more the simpler essence lower lies, more complex is more perfect, owning more discourse, more widely wise. Jeremiah 10 verse 10, God is, the living God, John 5 verse 26, he hath life in himself, unsearchable riches of positive attributes, John 17 verse 23, thou lovest me, manifoldness in.
Unity. This complexity in God is the ground of blessedness for him and of progress for us. 1 Timothy 1 verse 11, the blessed God. Jeremiah 9 verses 23 and 24, let him glory in this, that he knoweth me. The complex nature of God permits anger at the sinner and compassion for him at the same moment, Psalms 7 verse 11, a God that hath indignation every day, John 3 verse 16, God so loved the world, Psalms 85 verses 10 and 11, mercy and truth are met together. See Julius Muller, Doct. Sin, 2 colon 1 16 square, Schweitzer, Glaubenslayer, 1 colon 2 2 9 2 3 5, Timasius, Christie Person and Work, 1 43, 50, Martinson, Dogmatics, 91, If God were the simple one, the mystic abyss in which every form of determination were extinguished, there would be nothing in the unity to be known. Hence, nominalism is incompatible with the idea of revelation. We teach, with realism, that the attributes of God are objective determinations in his revelation and as such are rooted in his inmost essence. 2. The attributes in here in the divine essence. They are not separate existences. They are attributes of God. While we oppose the nominalistic view which holds them to be mere names with which, by the necessity of our thinking, we clothe the one simple divine essence, we need equally to avoid the opposite realistic extreme of making them separate parts of a composite God. We cannot conceive of attributes except as belonging to an underlying essence which furnishes their ground of unity. In representing God as a compound of attributes, realism endangers the living unity of the Godhead. Notice the analogous necessity of attributing the properties of matter to an underlying substance, and the phenomena of thought to an underlying spiritual essence, else matter is reduced to mere force, and mind, to mere sensation. In short, all things are swallowed up in a vast idealism. The purely realistic explanation of the attributes tends to low and polytheistic conceptions of God. The mythology of Greece was the result of personifying the divine attributes. The nomina were turned into noumena, as Max Muller says, see Taylor, Nature on the Basis of Realism, 293. Instance also Christmas Evans's sermon describing a council in the Godhead, in which the attributes of justice, mercy, wisdom, and power argue with one another. Robert Hall called Christmas Evans, the one-eyed orator of Anglesey, but added that his one eye could, light an army through a wilderness. See Joseph Cross, Life and Sermons of Christmas Evans, 112116, David Rees Stephen, Memoirs of. Christmas Evans, 168176. We must remember that, realism. May so exalt the attributes that no personal subject is left to constitute the ground of unity. Looking upon personality as anthropomorphism, it falls into a worse personification, that of omnipotence, holiness, benevolence, which are mere blind thoughts, unless there is one who is the omnipotent, the holy, the good. See Luthard, Compendium de Dogmatic, 70. 3. The attributes belong to the divine essence as such. They are to be distinguished from those other powers or relations which do not appertain to the divine essence universally. The personal distinctions, proprietates, in the nature of the one God are not to be denominated attributes, for each of these personal distinctions belongs not to the divine essence as such and universally, but only to the particular person of the Trinity who bears its name, while on the contrary all of the attributes belong to each of the persons. The relations which God sustains to the world, predicata, moreover, such as creation, preservation, government, are not to be denominated attributes, for these are accidental, not necessary or inseparable from the idea of God. God would be God, if he had never created. To make creation eternal and necessary is to dethrone God and to enthrone a fatalistic development. It follows that the nature of the attributes is to be illustrated, not alone or chiefly from wisdom and holiness in man, which are not inseparable from man's nature, but rather from intellect and will in man, without which he would cease to be man altogether. Only that is an attribute, of which it can be safely said that he who possesses it would, if deprived of it, cease to be God. Shed, Dogm. Theol, 1 335, the attribute is the whole essence acting in a certain way. The center of unity is not in any one attribute, but in the essence. The difference between the divine attribute and the divine person is, that the person is a mode of the existence of the essence, while the attribute is a mode either of the relation, or of the operation, of the essence. 4. The attributes manifest the divine essence. The essence is revealed only through the attributes. 
apart from its attributes it is unknown and unknowable. But though we can know God only as he reveals to us his attributes, we do, notwithstanding, in knowing these attributes, know the being to whom these attributes belong. That this knowledge is partial does not prevent its corresponding, so far as it goes, to objective reality in the nature of God. All God's revelations are, therefore, revelations of himself in and through his attributes. Our aim must be to determine from God's works and words what qualities, dispositions, determinations, powers of his otherwise unseen and unsearchable essence he has actually made known to us, or in other words, what other revealed attributes of God. John 1 verse 18, No man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. 1 Timothy 6 verse 16, Whom no man hath seen, nor can see, Matt. 5 colon 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, 1127, Neither doth any man know the Father, save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son willeth to reveal him. C. A. Strong, Kant, not content with knowing the reality in the phenomena was trying to know the reality apart from the phenomena, he was seeking to know, without fulfilling the conditions of knowledge, in short, he wished to know without knowing. So agnosticism perversely regards God as concealed by his own manifestation. On the contrary, in knowing the phenomena we know the object itself. J. C. C. Clark, Self and the Father, 6, in language, as in nature, there. Are no verbs without subjects, but we are always hunting for the noun that has no adjective, and the verb that has no subject, and the subject that has no verb. Consciousness is necessarily a consciousness of self. Idealism and monism would like to see all verbs solid with their subjects, and to write I do, or I feel, in the mazes of a monogram, but consciousness refuses, and before it says do, or feel, it finishes saying I, J, G. Holland's Katrina, to her lover, God is not worshipped in his attributes. I do not love your attributes, but you. Your attributes all meet me otherwhere, blended in other personalities, nor do I love nor do I worship them, nor those who bear them. E'en the spotted pard will dare a danger which will make you pale, but shall his courage steal my heart from you? You cheat your conscience, for you know that I may like your attributes. Yet love not you.